Two years ago, I was part of a team that made a discovery, that made an announcement about a discovery that shook the world of planetary science. This involved taking risks and a fresh perspective. And that's my invitation to you today. To innovate, we have to try new things. So let me take you on a journey of exploration. And this story begins a long time ago, billions of years ago, when a simple single-celled bacteria, cyanobacteria, discovered photosynthesis. And in the process um, to like, harness energy from the environment, this is an amazing milestone, but as a waste byproduct generated oxygen, which was poisonous to life forms around it, but eventually, over a long, long time, was able to rea uh, react it away, but eventually accumulated in our atmosphere. And today we have 20% by volume oxygen in our atmosphere. You know, we all require oxygen to breathe. But without plants and photosynthetic bacteria, there'd be basically no oxygen in our atmosphere. And so part of this story in astronomy about wanting to know, are we alone? It's this thought that we can search for signs of life by gases made by, that might be attributed to life. So I love to imagine there's, an, can we um, dim the lights a little bit here if possible? So I want them to be able to see the night sky, hopefully you've seen the gorgeous dark sky. But I love to imagine that somewhere out there, not too far away, there's an intelligent alien civilization on a planet orbiting a nearby star. And they have the kind of telescopes we're hoping to build, and they're looking back at our planet. And they'll suspect there's life here. That's not from giant structures like the Great Wall of China, not from pollution or city lights, but from oxygen, a gas that uh, doesn't belong in the context with the rest of the atmosphere. It's so reactive, it shouldn't be here right away. So the controversial thing I was a part of two years ago was also the discovery of a gas on another planet, like oxygen, one that's not made by, in quantities made by, like lightning or meteors or or coming out of volcanoes, and that gas is phosphine, and the planet is Venus. And although where we are today in the story I'm going to tell you, it's not per se related to phosphine, but I wanted to kind of take you on this story and, and show you where it goes. Now, why is it so controversial to think about life on Venus? Well, most of you know that Venus is it's actually a terrible place for life. It has a massive carbon dioxide greenhouse atmosphere, making the surface too hot for life as we know it, really too hot for any solvent that, could, that life would need. But just like here on Earth, if you hike up a mountain, it gets colder and colder, and so too on Venus. So that 50 kilometers above the surface, the temperature is just right for life. Oddly enough, the pressures are similar as well. And this inspired uh, Carl Sagan over half a century ago to propose this idea that maybe there's life in the clouds. Here on Earth, there's life in our clouds. Bacteria get swept up from the surface, and they go inside cloud droplets mostly. They stay up there for about a week before being rained back down. But on Venus, unlike on Earth, where our clouds are very fragmented, the clouds are 100% cloud cover on Venus. They're always there. The clouds are vertically extensive. That sounds good, but in fact, it's still a nasty place for life because there's very little water, and the clouds are not made of water, actually. They're made of sulfuric acid. So it sounds like most of you know what sulfuric acid is, but just in case you didn't, I did have this little story to share with you. During the first pandemic summer, there were you know, no jobs, no sports, sports fields were closed, and teenagers didn't have much to do. So I got my then 70-year-old son to work on um, initial work for Venus, and he pushed to do real experiments. So you can't order, and this was the summer, so everything was closed, so we were working outside on our front porch. And we couldn't uh, order a lot of big amounts of sulfuric acid to you know, your house, but we could order some, lots of small bottles. So if you're a 17-year-old boy and your job is to, you know, although most of it's known already, but experiment for ourselves, which types of materials are um, resistant to sulfuric acid and you're looking around you outside, what's the first thing you would choose to test? 17-year-old boy. He just grabbed an ant and put it in the sulfuric acid. Before you could blink an eye, it had a seizure and turned to goo. So sulfuric acid is bad for our life. Nonetheless, you know, in exoplanets, um, we do have this kind of theme that the line between what is you know, mainstream research and what is crazy is constantly shifting. So if we were here 25, 30 years ago, we wouldn't, no one would be talking about exoplanets. It was just too not mainstream. 
And I think you all realize the search for life on Venus is on the other side of crazy. It's still on that crazy side of the line. So I was been working on exoplanets and the thought of finding gases in the atmosphere that don't belong. We're not quite there yet. We're kind of on the verge of being able to. We can study atmospheres, but not of small rocky planets, not yet. And my team had been working on phosphine as a really interesting biosignature gas because on Earth it's only associated with life. And it's thermodynamically disfavored. It doesn't want to form here at the conditions we have on Earth. Well, we got connected with someone across the globe, Professor Jane Greaves, who actually did want to search for signs of life on Venus. And she also realized phosphine, a phosphorus atom attached to three hydrogen atoms, um, through like casing the literature, would be a suitable uh, choice. And she didn't expect to find it. It took her a long time to get telescope time. And here's a picture of some radio telescopes that she used. Someone connected our two teams, and we uh, worked with her to help with, uh, interpret the data. So perhaps some of you remember this, but a couple of years ago, we did make an announcement about the discovery of tiny amounts of phosphine gas in the Venus atmosphere. And in this case, you know, we're not claiming we found life on Venus. We were claiming we detected phosphine gas, whose existence is a mystery, because either there's some kind of unknown chemistry, you know, or very possibly it leaves room for life production. And this immediately became incredibly controversial for a lot of reasons, but I do feel like one of them you know, so even before people looked at the data or dived into the 100-page paper explaining all the chemistry, people just naturally wanted to react that it just can't be. And there were a lot of legitimate excuses, and I'm not going like, to have time to go through all of them. I'll pick one, and that is a fair one. It's the data analysis. Because our big facilities, by the way, it seems a bit ironic, but they're not designed to look at very, very bright objects. Like, Venus is so bright in the night sky. It's also spatially resolved. And it's a tiny signal that we were looking for, and there's a lot of noise in the data. And so we have to like, analyze the data and remove the noise, and there's a lot of disagreement with how the team did that. So people did reanalyze the data, and many teams did not recover the signal. Some teams did recover the signal, but then wanted to attribute the gas to one that's not phosphine, but another gas, sulfur dioxide. And I just wanted to sort of put this snapshot out here because the search for life by way of a gas that doesn't belong, is something an astronomer actually thought about nearly 100 years ago, James Jeans. And today we're finally confronting this, and we thought it would be a lot easier than, uh, than it's been anyway. And just FYI, those interested in Mars, there's a similar story of methane on Mars, which, may have, may, which I just found out from the Mars community, people either don't believe or are agnostic on. It also started out with people on Earth observing methane on Mars, and although we've had Orbiter and a rover has found Mars, it's still really controversial 15 or 20 years later. So our work inspired a lot of different things, including some people revisited the NASA Pioneer data. NASA sent a probe to Venus that went down through the atmosphere, and they found signs of phosphine gas in that old data. I have one more slide about phosphine, and I just wanted to... Um, you don't have to understand this slide to understand the rest of the talk, but... Just so you see that, this plot is to convince you that science is working. People find something, perhaps people don't believe it or it's controversial, but it goes back and forth. And this is just a snapshot of a big table where every paper is written along um, a column and row, such that along the diagonal we summarize the paper. Discovery paper, you know, mid-eye observations, reanalysis. And I'll pick one example. So if you went here, Villanueva 2020, You'd say they reanalyze the data, don't find the signal, reanalyze a different set of data, find the signal. And you can kind of just go back to each square and see what the response is, a snapshot. So it's a little complicated, but I wanted you to know that Professor Jane Greaves and the analysis side of the team, they are literally responding to every single criticism to go back and forth. And this sort of will evolve for, for a while. But what I really wanted to talk about um, is just more about Venus. And phosphine has done this incredible thing. It's like, I know it's maybe the wrong audience, but it's like a gateway drug. That phosphine just drew this huge attention to Venus. And many, many things are happening now, and I'm going to try to explain a few of them to you that I think are just revolutionary. Now, one thing I did based on phosphine was I assembled a team of people to study Venus and what kind of space missions could we spend, send to Venus to search for signs of life or even life itself. 
And this topic is too taboo for big government agencies like NASA or ESA or even some private founders just don't like this. It makes them feel really um, uncomfortable. But when I put this team together, I did another slightly controversial thing. First of all, I didn't pick anyone who um, had worked on Venus before with one exception. And I avoided any okay, cranky older people. And um, I, can, um, consider, I can consider myself one of those in my original field of exoplanet research, but I, you know, I didn't want, I needed to get like fresh ideas and to let people think freely without feeling like they would come to a meeting and not have their voice heard. So my team had to work really hard because we didn't have a lot of the base knowledge. We started from scratch. We had big community meetings where we would have like 80 people attend from the wider Venus community. And we did a lot of really interesting things. We, and this is, we means like an extended team of about 20 people. Um, you know, we invented new instruments. We looked at old data. It turns out that there was data from the former Soviet Union who had sent over a dozen probes through the atmosphere and NASA's Pioneer Venus mission. Data that wasn't understood, that has been shelved, like people stopped worrying about it. Like tiny amounts of oxygen a tentative detection of ammonia, and like a major depletion of sulfur dioxide and water vapor in the clouds, as well as some of the cloud particles um, being, uh, apparently being not made of sulfuric acid. They were measured to be um, not spherical, and sulfuric acid is a liquid at the temperatures and pressures of Venus, so it has to be more or less spherical. So that's pretty interesting. And everything that, since I've been working on Venus for a few years, I'd heard was that this sulfuric acid is basically dead to any interesting chemistry to speak of. So my team, and we had a small amount of money from Breakthrough Initiatives, we did some experiments. And the one on the left I'm not going to talk about, but I'll leave that for your, in case you want to read about it later. I'm going to talk about the one on the right. And one of the teams we asked to um, study sulfuric acid, and they seeded it with small organic molecules, which actually grew into a rich organic chemistry, right in the sulfuric acid droplets. And on researching through the literature, found that like another field, they already know that. So somehow, for so long, the planetary science community just thought sulfuric acid is just nothing. And it turns out it's the oil industry that uses concentrated sulfuric acid to a refined crude oil to more sophisticated products. In the process, they get something they call red oil. One person's trash is another person's treasure. Huh. It's full of things, like even aromatic rings. So that was pretty surprising. We also got a postdoc, Daniel Dusevich, in the Jack Shostak lab at Harvard to, it was my colleague Janusz Petkowski and he chose some lipids, so actual biological materials that could, in the Jack Shostak lab, they're trying to literally create life from scratch. But we had them take these lipids, put it in sulfuric acid, and they were able to like form a vesicle. That's not saying they formed like a cell wall, but there are some materials that are resistant to sulfuric acid. Now, that son I told you about, who was 17, he's now 19 and a sophomore, and I, this summer we worked on a project together with help from other family members and also some friends at Harvard. And I'm gonna just tell you about that briefly now, and I just want you to know you're the first audience I'm telling this to. So we got inspired through like a kind of convoluted path to test some complicated molecules in sulfuric acid. And he being a biochemistry student, I was he was able to teach me some things, help set up a lab, and we kind of went from there, also with help from our Harvard friends. And what we decided to test, we just start with some complex molecules. And what we chose was our, our DNA, by the way, is not stable in sulfuric acid. You can think of it made of three components. The latter, you know, those are the DNA bases, nucleic acid bases, a backbone, and a linker. So the backbone and linker are not stable, but what we tested was our um, nucleic acid bases, ACGT, adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine, and a bunch of other related molecules, and we have found that they are all stable in sulfuric acid. And we're blown away by this. We hope you are too. We've just uh, finished our paper, and we're, we're about to submit it. And we think that, and we're not saying that, you know, life exists on Venus, but we're saying that there's this revolution that there's interesting chemistry there. There's no question about that in my mind. So what are we going to do about this? We're going to go back to Venus, and we're going to search for, study these droplets, and try to understand them in more detail. By the way, during all this unfolding of all of these events I was telling you about, NASA and ESA both decided to send missions back to Venus. 
they're not going to be doing any astrobiology or searching the cloud particles at all. So now we have the first ever private mission to Venus. It's like throwing a rock at Venus. It's just small and cheap and fast. And I'm going to tell you now for the last part of my talk what we're going to be doing. So we have a small mission. Oh, I forgot to say one thing here. So Rocket Lab, we've partnered with Rocket Lab. They have a small uh, mass capability. They launch typically out of New Zealand, and their companies in New Zealand and the USA. So they're going to launch a rocket, and in the top of that rocket is a spacecraft called, um, they call Photon, and Photon is the cruise vehicle, which will take a few months to get to Venus, and it's going to drop a probe in the atmosphere. So being a cheap, fast mission, there's no parachute. It's just going to go fast. It takes an hour to go down to the surface, spending only a few minutes in the clouds that we care about. We have an instrument. We call it autofluorescence nephilometer. And we're going to search for fluorescence in the cloud particles. On the left, there's a young man there getting a special eye test for his cornea. And you, there's a black light held on the left by the doctor. But I'm just reminding you what fluorescence is. You've all seen this somewhere before. I'm not sure where. And on the right, there's a figure showing you what our colleagues did in the lab. They um, tried different wavelengths of excitation, and they had a detector that measured different emission. And each of these points, these points are different organic molecules showing you that they fluoresce. They light up blue when hit by a blue laser or a laser of different colors. We chose our instrument to be up here at the top just for practical reasons for what was available. And our instrument is going to shine a light through a window, shine a UV laser through a window and see if these particles fluoresce. If they do, it'll be incredibly strong evidence that there are organic molecules in the Venus cloud particles, specifically like ringed molecules, where the electrons are not, or they're delocalized, they're not as tightly bound. And so uh, I just have a couple more technical slides for those who are sort of engineering minded. What you see on the left here is the setup of our prototype. It's in the Maggie Tolbert lab at the University of Colorado Boulder. Here's a schematic, and here's what the instrument looks like. Um, here's a schematic of the Rocket Lab probe. And the instrument fits here. It's just showing you shining a light out to reach the cloud particles outside. So I just wanted to, um, to you know, say a few more words about Venus, because it's in this incredible planet right next door. It sort of reminds me of how in families with siblings, there's the one sibling who gets all the attention. That would be Mars in this case, Earth, Mars, and Venus. And there's the one planet, Venus, that's always been ignored. It's been over four decades since we've sent a spacecraft to Venus. So we do have several other missions in mind. We'd love to culminate this mission with atmospheric sample return so we could really use our best instruments here on Earth to search for signs of life directly. So in summary, I'd just like to give you my conclusions. The takeaways for you is that Venus has many long-standing mysteries. Some were measured directly in the atmosphere by probes from 40 years ago. And they were shelved because people weren't able to fully reconcile all of them. Some of these may be indications of life on Venus. Brand new sulfuric acid clouds are not sterile to interesting organic chemistry based on new lab experiments. And so that's why I called my talk a new era for Venus exploration. It's the phosphine discovery that motivated a flurry of new activity, revisit of old data, new models, fresh look at chemistry. Well, it's a vast universe out there just waiting to be explored. I wish you clear skies, clear thoughts, and an incredible journey of your own. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So um, as a DNA chemist, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative. Um, when you find life, uh, will it be DNA-based? I think it will not. Well, let me rephrase that. I, like probably you and others, believe life needs an informational polymer of some kind. So it may be similar to our DNA, but it can't be the same, at least in the case of Venus, because we know our DNA can't survive in sulfuric acid. That, that was fascinating. Um, I was just wondering, what's the difference between the Venus community and the Mars community? What, what, what determines if somebody goes to the Mars community rather than the Venus community? And is it, is it kind of like Trump Biden? I mean, can you have the two? Can you have the two in the same family and speak to each other or not? 
Okay, I'm going to have to take that one away and get back to you like next meeting because <laughs> I myself, I'm still a bit of an outsider in this community and I honestly don't really know, but I do believe it goes back to childhood in that people, I'm not making this up, okay? You know the kids love dinosaurs? Some kids just fixate on Mars. And when you find the people who want to go to Mars or they work on Mars, you know, most of them will say that they've had an interest in Mars since they were a child. <laughs> now, Peter Beck, the founder and CEO of Rocket Lab, he wanted to go to Venus completely independent of my team. And he dreamed of sending rockets to Venus since he was a child. So that's the best I can do right now. <laughs> Dan O'Sara. Yeah, Dan O'Sara. I'm sorry. I'm an inorganic chemist, so I have to ask a yeah. chemistry question. Because um, phosphine's a base, and sulfuric acid's an acid, and usually acids react with bases. If, if there is phosphine, does that, I mean, I would be surprised that it could exist in acid. The ant can't, and a base wouldn't. Does that suggest there could be vacuoles where, in the atmosphere where sulfuric acid doesn't exist, or, or is it fully dense, and, and there aren't volumes where you may have things collect inside a vacuole of sulfuric acid. Yes, well, yes, definitely uh, phosphine is a base, ammonia is a base, and these gases may um, cause the sulfuric acid you know, to change for sure. That's kind of one of the theories floating around. It's like a fog, so there are spots without, but it's pretty foggy, let's say. Yep, pretty foggy. <laughs> yep. So the idea is that like on Earth with oxygen, phosphine would have to be continually produced. If it's getting sucked into the droplet and destroyed, it sort of always has to be made. In the back, I think. So I'm a computer scientist, and excuse me if this question is way too naive, but when you see life, how do you know it's life? What is life? How do you define life? Well, I think we can have a discussion of that later on with the biologists here. I don't think people have a great answer to that right now, you know, what is life? Honestly, what we'd love to see are little, um, we'd love to see like little cell-like structures moving around that's different from Brownian motion. We'd like to see that, and we'd like to see very complex organic molecules that really don't make any sense about forming just in the environment on their own. I have a very naive question similar to the one before me. Um, is there room for conceiving of alternative life different from the way it is defined on Earth? Good question. First of all, there's still somewhat of a disagreement of how we define life on Earth. So that's tricky in and of itself. But there's definitely room for life that's very different from ours here. Some people may disagree with me on this, but you know, here we have chemists. We, I always imagine maybe there's, instead of chemical life, some kind of mechanical life out there, you know, like a windmill that can get energy from currents. So we really honestly don't know. We're like so terracentrically focused, it's often um, a struggle like to think broadly enough. <laughs>